Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, hello everyone, and thanks for participating here in our RSG webinars. Today we will have the talk, a great talk, uh, Research Data Management, Why and How, by Jasmine Turki Max from uh, TU Delft in Netherlands, and she is a data steward. Maybe uh, Jasmine can explain <laughs> us what is sure. uh, what, what this means uh, data steward. And right. Jasmine, thanks for accepting our invitation, and please uh, go ahead with your great talk. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice. Uh inviting me for this webinar. Uh, thanks a lot for organizing the webinar and also I would like to thank all the participants for joining the webinar. Uh, yeah, my name is Yasemin. Uh, and so first of all, I have seen in the event invitation, I already got my PhD title. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, I don't have it yet, so I'm uh, still writing my thesis, but it is nice that uh, there are some people who are already eager to give me my title. That felt really good. <laughs> okay. Oh, that means, sorry, uh, for, for me, it was impossible to turn off your cam, and if you... It's okay. Prepare Just one second. Off. Of course, okay. thank you for letting me know. Turn off. Okay. So, you can hear me now, right? Uh, I believe, yes, perfect. Okay, so uh, I have done my PhD uh, in UV light induced DNA damage and repair, so molecular biology. And uh, during my PhD, I regularly use techniques such as proteomics and microscopy to address my research questions. And uh, since last year, uh, I'm working as a data steward indeed at TABELT and at the faculty I'm working. I'm the first point of contact uh, regarding any question about data for the researchers. And it could be really anything about data storage, data sharing, data archiving, costs, um, as well as tools for data and software management. And uh, so today I would like to talk about the why and how of research data management. And for the why part, I'm going to focus on the reproducibility crisis, uh, founders and publishers requirements, as well as selfish benefits, why it is good uh, for you to do research data management. And I would also like to talk about the how part by focusing on data archiving, data documentation, secure, uh, secure data storage and backup data organization, and I will also touch upon resource, resources and training materials for good practices in scientific computing. So I won't exactly follow up this order, especially for the why part, because I will be uh, revisiting the benefits, and I hope to convince you by the end of this webinar that this is really good for you. Uh, so reproducibility crisis. So according to a recent survey that was carried out by Nature, Almost all of the participants that has uh, taken the survey has said, yes, there is a reproducibility crisis and around half of the uh, participants said it is a significant crisis. And when they were asked whether they have ever failed to reproduce an experiment themselves, uh, you see when we look at, for example, biology, uh, people did not have difficulty to reproduce some other people's results, but also their own results. And when we think about then what are the factors that contribute to reproducible research? So we see uh, factors such as selective reporting, pressure to publish, low statistical power, but we also see methods and code being unavailable and raw data not being available from the original lab. To have a better understanding of this, I guess it's a good idea to take a closer look to the research data lifecycle. So this is an example from my research, uh, what I've done during my PhD, but I think there are quite some similarities between different uh, disciplines. So on the left-hand side, you see the raw data that I have generated. Uh, so these are cells. I made their image in the microscopy, and you see that they are red because they have a fluorescent signal inside. So what I would do is, after generating this raw data in the microscope, I would go to my own PC 
I use an image analysis program, in this, pro in this case, ImageJ, to quantify the fluorescent signal inside these cells. And as an example, you see different conditions such as ABCD, and you see the fluorescence intensity coming from each single cell converted into a numerical value. This generates my, uh, this constitutes my intermediate data. And from here, what I would do is to plot a graph, just like the example on the right hand side, so I can compare different conditions. What happens is that when we publish our results in papers, most of the time we only publish this final data, which is kind of a snapshot. It does not reveal the actual numerical values that has enabled generation of this plot. It does not reveal how the plot was generated. It also does not reveal the original raw data, <coughs> which enabled the numerical values in the first place. So this brings up the question, then are the published final data actually available for validation, reproduction, or reuse? So first of all, reuse is important because if you think about it, research takes a lot of time, money, and effort. And not everyone has also the access to the facilities uh, that one uh, other research groups has access so they can perform the experiments. And if the researchers share their data, make it available and share their data openly, then there could be other researchers who do not have access to the facilities, but they have the capacity to analyze the data and come up with uh, another interesting story, which even maybe the first research group was not interested in the first place. But also validation and reproduction are very important, because if you think about it, Research relies on the fact that we validate each of these results so, and then we can build on top of each of these results. And to be able to do that, we need to reproduce each of these results. And especially for this, it's very important to uh, have access to the experimental methods and measurement parameters and how the analysis was done and so on. And if you look at how a research paper is written, it's a lot of work. And when uh, finally a researcher comes to the stage of finalizing it, most of the time materials and method section is the part there's, they spend the least effort. And if you think about it for reproduction, it's actually one of the most important parts. And if we look, how is it, uh, how is the current culture done in terms of data sets? So a lot of publications have a statement such as the data sets uh, in this publication are available uh, upon request. And a recent study which has addressed this has found out that the data sets which are claimed to be available are actually not available. Data availability decreases 17% per year and chance of email address working decreases 7% per year. So Especially the second one is not surprising, considering that uh, in uh, academia it's very common for researchers to uh, change their institutes, their countries even, and each time get a different email address. And if that is the only way to access the researcher and access to the data, obviously it's not surprising that people cannot have access to the data anymore. So since we touch upon this, I would like to very briefly mention ORCID. So if you don't have one, please get one. Uh, it's a persistent identifier for researchers. So even if your surname, your email address, your affiliation changes, you will be always uh, accessible and also all of your work will be linked to you. But then what's the alternative to sharing on request? Well, it is archiving in the repository. And what is a repository? It's a place where things can be stored and shared. And there are all sorts of repositories for data sets, for protocols, for software. So for example, you can take a look at r3data.org, which is the registry of resource data repositories. And uh, if you are to group repositories, we can group them into as uh, general purpose or discipline specific. For example, for discipline specific, there are repositories for images, nucleotides, proteins, and so on. And here's an example. So Dryad is a general uh, purpose repository. And uh, as you see, 
uh, this is a data set and the data set has its own DOI, has its own digital object identifier. And this is very important because uh, I believe you are familiar with DOIs from uh, publications. There is a reason for that because uh, an academic publication is a valuable digital object and it's important for it to be never to get never lost on internet, so never get this 404 not found uh, sign. And uh, it's a persistent identifier. And also, once an item has a digital object identifier, that I identifier also facilitates uh, that digital item to get citations. And uh, if you look uh, here, you see when using this data, please cite the original publication. Additionally, please cite the Dryad data package. So there's an extra statement for citations for the data set. Data set. And then what happens is that, first of all, the authors do not receive requests for uh, email, re emails with requests for data anymore. And this way, they do not get citations only for their papers, but also for their data sets. And this actually allows them to get increased visibility and impact. And if you think about it, research takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And why should you limit yourself to a single PDF file? There is so much more work behind underlying that PDF file. There is your data sets, your codes, your protocols. And you can actually make it available, you can publish it, you can get separate uh, publications that way, and you can get more and more citations that way. And especially this is important if you're an early career researcher, because it takes really time to get your uh, publications, but you have a lot of work that you have contributed to already, so why not uh, get credit for it? So there are repositories for images, there are repositories for protocols. Uh, this is one that I really like, protocols.io. So it is, as I also briefly mentioned before, uh, unfortunately, the information in materials and methods section is most of the time not enough. And this is really uh, not a surprise if you see a statement such as contact author for details or we use a slightly modified version of the method reported in such and such paper. So protocols.io is a free and open platform that enables publication of protocols. It is not only wet lab protocols. As you see, there are also computational protocols that are shared and the uh, uh, protocols get their own DOI, can get citations, and they can be linked to uh, an existing publication like in this case, but they can also be published as a standalone item without uh, being have to be linked to any uh, academic publication. And if you are using GitHub, uh, you can also actually make uh, your repository available on Zenodos. So you make kind of a snapshot and then get a DOI for your repository. And this way you can make it available for citations. And uh, if you are wondering how that works, you can uh, check uh, this nice video that's generated uh, by Open Science MOOC. And they have a lot of nice resources. So I would really recommend if you're interested or you can check the second link, which explains step by step how to do this. And uh, or maybe you always wanted to start using GitHub, but you didn't know where to start. Then I would recommend this video from Open Science MOOC. Since I mentioned Zenodo, I would like to get in, into a little bit more detail. So Zenodo is the uh, archive that is generated by, uh, uh, created by CERN in Switzerland. As you know, they are doing very important research there for whole humanity, but only uh, obviously very few researchers have access to the facilities there. So this is why they made the, the data they are generating available through uh, Zenodo and uh, themselves. And this way they have seen how successful it was. A lot of researchers uh, made use of the data, analyzed the data, wrote many nice publications. And this is how they came up to the decision. Hmm, why not make this available for all researchers in all disciplines? So you can make use of Zenodo. Today, my presentation is also located on Zenodo. Uh, we also, as a team of data stewards at TEDA, we always uh, openly share all our work through Zenodo. It, is, it can be used for posters, presentations, data sets, images, video, audio, software, lessons, 
and uh, you can also use it for preprints and you can determine access rights so open embargo restrict or close access you can choose a license to determine the reusage rights so if you're wondering what type of licenses are there so for open data, uh, Creative Commons licenses are used. And uh, for example, Creative Commons Zero license puts no restrictions. So anyone can uh, use uh, and reuse the data, modify and build upon. So our advice is the use of CC BY license. So it is uh, still allowing users to um, make use of the data, build upon uh, and modify the data, and only requirement is to give credit to the original creator. And there's also a citation uh, statement available, uh, let's say, for example, with Zenodo, you have uploaded your data. And if you are to share a software and code, there are different licenses that are more suitable for that, uh, such as MIT, OPT, or GNU. And uh, our recommendation is the MIT license as this, that is the least restrictive license in terms of the reuse it right. Um, so uh, this is also uh, more and more anyhow becoming a requirement from the founder's side. So the fair data principles means that data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this actually gathered a lot of support recently and an increasing number of funders are asking researchers to make their data in line with the fair data principles by, uh, uh, by archiving the data with proper documentation, a suitable repository. And they are asking for this because they also want to make sure that the uh, results reach more people, have greater impact. They would like to avoid the duplication of efforts and preserve the data for future researchers. And publishers as well. So, for example, with PLOS One, as you see, all data and related metadata, which is documentation, uh, about your data underlying the findings uh, reported in a submitted manuscript should be deposited in an appropriate public repository unless already provided as a part of the submitted article and they can be either subject specific uh, or generalist repositories such as Dryad and Figshare. And when we look at science, you again see a quite similar statement. And um, again, as I said, more and more journals are actually coming up uh, with uh, similar statements. And data archiving is very good, but as you can imagine, it only makes sense for future users if the data is documented in a proper way. And there are various ways to do this. So it can be done in a human readable way, such as uh, writing a readme file with information about the methods that are used for data collection and analysis, as well as data specific information, such as parameters, variables, column headings, symbols used, etc. So if you're interested at the link below, you can find a template for that. It also could be machine readable, and this can be achieved by uh, using a metadata standard with defined fields. It could be generic, such as title, data, creators, keywords, but it also could be disciplinary standard. And if it's possible, uh, that's, uh, of course, very good to make use of such disciplinary standards. And if you're interested at the two uh, bottom links, you can find um, examples uh, and existing standards. Uh, but yes, so I've been so far more talking about the archiving part, but to be able to come there, of course, data needs to be managed uh, properly uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is why uh, during the, uh, this part of my talk, I would like to talk about secure data storage and backup, data organization, such as file and folder organization, file naming, version control, and experimental notes. So data loss, it does happen, unfortunately. This is a recent case that happened in Manchester, and due to fire, uh, valuable resource data was lost. So this is why it's very important to take necessary measures to avoid data loss. Uh, backup uh, data, back, uh, backing up data regularly, and if possible, in an automatic manner, so you don't have to think about, oh, when am I going to again uh, back up my data and you don't uh, risk losing data. Uh, creating at minimum two copies of your data, storing the data at multiple trusted locations and using reliable backup solutions. 
So I understand that it's very easy and attractive to use uh, hard disks, USBs, personal computers for storing data. But especially if you do not have a backup strategy, then uh, it's an imitation for data loss because these devices can get lost, can get stolen, or can misfunction and you lose access, you lose your uh, valuable data. Cloud solutions could be also very attractive and easy to use. Um, I would say always read the small print. Uh, for example, if you would like to make use of Google Drive, the free account, uh, this is what you agree to. When you upload, submit, store, send, or receive content to or through our services, you give Google a worldwide license to use, host, store, reproduce, modify, create derivative works, communicate, publish, publicly perform, publicly display, and distribute such content. And this license continues even if you stop using our services. Um, well, data organization, I guess this is a familiar example. Uh, it can happen to any of us. So what is important here is to be consistent and organize your data in a way that's meaningful to you, but also to your colleagues and allows you to find your files easily, which can be done by having a hierarchical uh, folder structure, such as projects, subfolder experiments, subfolder instruments, or type of files, subfolder dates, and so on. So at this link, you can also find an example of a folder organization structure if you're interested. Another important thing is file naming. So this kind of names uh, could be very logical at the moment uh, the file is generated, but not uh, three years time, actually, even uh, in a matter of few weeks, you may have difficulty to remember what the file was about and you may have dif difficulties to find the actual file you are looking for. This is why it's important to follow a suitable file naming convention. So my recommendation is to start uh, with the day uh, with the dates in year, month, uh, day formats. And the reason for that is if you do that, you can very easily, chron in a chronological way, order your files. And this could be followed by file type, researcher's name and initials, version number of the file. So, for example, I named today's presentations according to the suggestions. You can be as creative as you want, but please keep in mind the, for not making your file names too long, because if you do that, when you copy your files between different drives, you risk uh, losing them. Another important thing is to avoid avoid special special characters and spaces because those may not be read by every system, every computer. And actually, it's a good practice to include a readme file to explain the use naming conventions. So this would be useful for your colleagues but also it would be useful for uh, future users, especially if you are archiving a collection of data sets so they can easily uh, locate the file they are looking for. So version control, again, very important. You can do it manually just by uh, each time giving a different number to your files, but obviously that only works if you are working uh, with a small uh, group of files and if you are working with large groups of data sets, that's, uh, is, that's not going to work. Or let's say you are uh, writing uh, and uh, you are writing together with multiple authors it can also get out of hand and you don't know what is the most recent version. So if you are uh, using or if you have used Google Docs before, you may recognize this. So uh, it offers opportunity to check the all version history. And here on the right hand side, you see all of the changes that was made by me with timestamps. And you can always go back uh, and you can always restore to a previous version that you would like. And obviously, this is uh, this can be used as a version control system for uh, text. But if you're working with data, there are many other solutions. Uh, so, for example, we recommend the use of use of subversion for data, and especially for coding, it's very important to use a version control system uh, such as Git. Um, 
And experimental notes. It is very important, of course, how uh, a certain experiment is done. And in especially wet labs, it's very common to have paper lab notes books, such as these ones. It's very typical that every single PhD student leaves behind a shelf full of this uh, paper lab notes books. And if you open one, this is how it looks. Good luck uh, with trying to understand those scribbles there and trying to locate the data that you are uh, looking for. So there's an alternative called electronic lab notebooks. Uh, these are uh, digital products that allow digital documentation, categorization and linking of raw, intermediate, final data, experiments and measurement parameters, samples. They are digital, therefore they are searchable. And they offer version control, uh, therefore they are traceable and fraud proof. I also would like to mention Open Science Framework. So Open Science Framework is not an electronic lab notebook, but it is a free and open platform uh, for project uh, workspace. It's a collaborative environment, so you can work within your research group, but also outside your research group. It offers version control. It allows access control at both project and file levels, so you can determine who has access to what. And all these digital items can, can get their own persistent identifiers, which also helps a lot in terms of linking them, locating them, and so on. Um, it has integrations uh, with such as Dropbox, GitHub, Google Drive, Dataverse, uh, and also Open Science Framework has two other cool, really cool functions. So one is a pre-registration. So uh, it's actually a very good idea because uh, once you pre-register your research plans, then regardless of getting positive or negative results, you always publish your results. And uh, this uh, helps actually with the publication bias. And uh, this really helps with being transparent. And uh, you can also use Open Science Framework to publish your preprints. Uh, so let's say you are uh, publishing, you are going to publish, but of course it takes quite some time to finally get your paper out. You can already make your work available for the community and people can already give feedback and they can already find about your research. Uh, so before finalizing, I would like to uh, share a couple of papers. So this was something I came across and I thought this could be very interesting for you. And as you see, uh, there are quite some topics that I also tried to touch upon today, such as file and directory organization, lab notebook, uh, as well as version control. So if you're interested, please find it at the link below. And uh, I was also checking this uh, paper and I would like to briefly go through it because I really like it. Uh, so they came up with uh, six good enough practices for scientific computing. Uh, so for data management, saving both raw and intermediate forms, documenting all steps, creating tidy data amenable to analysis for software, writing, organizing and sharing scripts and programs used in an analysis. Collaboration, making it easy for existing and new collaborators to understand and contribute to a project. Project organization, organizing the digital artifacts of a project to ease discovery and understanding. Tracking changes, recording how various components of your project change over time. And manuscripts, writing manuscripts in a way that leaves an audit trail and minimizes manual merging of conflicts. So this is a very brief summary, but there is a lot of nice tips in this publication. I would really recommend it. And finally, maybe you would like to start, uh, <clears throat> yeah, maybe you would want to start actually programming, but you don't know where to start. If that's the case, I hide hardly uh, highly recommend Software Carpentry, which is a nonprofit organization that aims to teach basic programming skills all around the world. And all of their materials are uh, freely and openly available. So you see they have courses on, um, sorry. You see they have courses on Unix shell, version control with Git, programming with Python and R. Uh, they will have courses in Spanish. So uh, you can either look for whether there is a workshop available in your region, but if you cannot find, you can also go through the material yourself. And they even have uh, discipline specific lessons. So for example, they have this very nice lesson uh, for genomics uh, data. And I would also uh, really recommend that one. 
this was all I wanted to tell. So uh, I hope you learned something new today and I'm very happy to receive your questions. So can you hear me, Jasmine? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Jasmine, for this uh, insightful talk. And um, please, if anyone uh, has questions, uh, please use the chat in order to write mm -hmm. the questions for uh, Jasmine. Yes, please. Questions? <laughs> okay, maybe I have one question for for, for Jasmine. So, Jasmine, I, I would like, uh, if it's possible, can you please describe how is your interaction with researchers at mm -hmm. your department? At your department, how is the 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 pipeline in order to encourage the researchers to know more about data management? Yes, of course. So. At TLOFT, we are a bit in a lucky situation, I have to say, that every faculty, so we have eight faculties, and every faculty has one full-time appointed data steward. So most of the time, this is a function that uh, people will have to do it next to being a researcher, and that makes it quite difficult, of course. But in our case, we are fully paid to do this, and therefore we do have the time and energy, and uh, we can... Yes go and approach researchers, we can also uh, do our best in uh, keeping track of what is the most recent developments in the field, what are the resources to share with the researchers and so on. And uh, yeah, so it happens in various ways, I have to say. Sometimes we approach and we ask them whether they would like to ask us any questions or there's anything we can do for them. And Many times they approach us, so it's really varies. It can be as basic as uh, what are the suitable data storage solutions or what is data archiving, because still there are some researchers that they think when they publish a paper, the data is available, but we'd say that's not the case. This is why it's uh, good to archive the data separately. And another thing is also the founders and publishing publisher requirements, because if they are publishing their paper and then they have to go with that data availability, then they approach us and ask our advice. But also with founders now, uh, two main founders in the Netherlands are actually asking uh, compliance with uh, fair data principles. And in Netherlands, there's also a lot of researchers which get uh, funding from European Commission and European Commission is asking that as well. And uh, then the researchers ask our help to be able to comply with these requirements. Okay. Thank you. So, any questions from the attendees? So uh, maybe I don't know if you if you know what was the main motivation of your department of mm -hmm, from the mm -hmm. university or from the university mm -hmm. to create to create a, a, a research data management uh, department or, or to 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 hire uh, data stewards. Yeah. So um, maybe you know in the last years, open science has been a very important movement uh, in Europe. So there are a lot of requirements, there are a lot of policy uh, that are uh, placed. And especially Netherlands has been one of the countries which took this uh, quite further. But when you talk to researchers, most of the time they are like, yes, of course, it's very good to do open science, but I don't know uh, what kind of tools are available. I don't have the time. I don't have the opportunity. So how do you expect me to do it? And you can also understand that because are they uh, supposed to do their research or are they supposed to follow up with all these recent uh, regulations and so on. And that was the main motivation at TADOV. They thought, okay, researchers actually do want to do this, but they really need some support. So why not um, create a role uh, where people can really enable researchers in following the good practices and so on. So that's how it came. Uh, but I have to say, it is not that we only ask people to openly publish everything, just put everything out in the open, because especially say DAFs works uh, with a lot of commercial companies. And in those cases, you do want to protect the intellectual property rights. So as data service, we also do quite some 
pay quite some attention to those topics. And it was clear that uh, there was a need in those topics as well. And fair data principles, which became a requirement from founders. And also last year, GDPR, the general data protection law, got into effect. And that also requires extra care. And we also provide support in there. And uh, with all these regulations change, changing, it became uh, obvious that there's support needed to uh, enable researchers follow them. So we can say that mainly uh, it's a, a European requirements from policies European, from European governments. Yeah, so it of course first came uh, at the policy level, but uh, what we try to do is uh, really uh, not go for compliance, but rather uh, encourage for the good practices and go for a cultural change. And that's also why I'm saying we are in a lucky situation where Delft really saw the value in all of this and they uh, decided to uh, support researchers by hiring full-time um, personnel for that. Sorry, do you hear me? For this, yeah, 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 oh. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for your yeah. great talk. If anyone have questions, last opportunity for questions. If you want to enter in contact with Jasmine, yes, it's please. possible. Please feel free to 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 send an email. You are very 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 glad to have here. We are very glad thank to very much. have you here. And thank you, Jasmine. And, and See you in the next uh, opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was really nice to see you again. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So, it's okay. <laughs>